We have John Morse, uh, Director of the Astrophysics Division, NASA Headquarters in Washington. Next, uh, Dan Patnod, uh, astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, next, Avi Loeb, astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Kim Weaver, astrophysicist at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And joining us by phone is Alex Filipenko, astrophysicist at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and with that, I'll hand off the discussion to John Morse. Thanks, Trent. Now, some missions are like good wine. They improve with time. And the Chandra X-ray Observatory is certainly one of our gems. If we could have the first graphic, please. Now, more than 11 years ago, Chandra was put into orbit by the STS-93 shuttle crew. And here we show the launch video back in 1999. And then this is the deploy on orbit. And that uh, booster uh, stage right there put Chandra into its final science orbit which takes it all the way up to 44,000 miles above the Earth and then swoops back in uh, every orbit. And it spends most of its time doing its science away from the Earth. Now, even starting with the first light image, there has been extraordinary wealth of data coming from this truly great observatory. So let's briefly look at some of the iconic data coming from Chandra over the past decade. In the first graphic, we have the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant. And this is an exploded star in the neighborhood of the sun, not too far away. And it shows us uh, very graphically how the elements uh, are born inside the stars and then distributed out into the interstellar medium. And the colors in this image actually tell us what the elements are, whether it's oxygen or iron and so on. In the next image, this is the Crab Nebula. And this shows swirling electrons around the pulsar at the middle of that exploded star. In the next image, we have the center of our galaxy. And uh, Chandra has probed the workings of supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies, including here in Sagittarius, in, in our own center of the Milky Way. In the next image, we have the bullet cluster. Here, in shown in the red, Chandra has mapped the X-rays coming from the hot normal matter as galaxy clusters collide out in the cosmos. And it has shown how it differs from the blue, which is mapping of the dark matter in this region. And it shows us how the normal matter and the dark matter actually behave differently. It doesn't tell us what dark matter is, but it's a very important clue as to its nature. And in the final image, this is a deep field showing us the X-ray glow from objects such as distant quasars. It tells us about the distribution of black holes throughout the universe. And Chandra is even responsible for making the only other independent measurement of the dark energy in the universe. So it's not surprising that Chandra scores well and in our most recent senior review of operating missions in astrophysics, it was right at the very top for its science impact. And so now let's hear about another one of the science uh, results from Chandra. Let me turn it over to Dan. Thank you. So today what we'd like to do is report on evidence for the detection of what might be the youngest black hole in, observed in our own cosmic neighborhood, born in a core collapse supernova. This uh, supernova was observed about 30 years ago. Now, core collapse supernova are associated with the deaths of massive stars, and it's believed that at least some of these events can result in the formation of black holes. Results such as this might actually be important because we don't know what the dividing line is between those supernova which form black holes and those which form neutron stars. This is something my colleague Avi will discuss in a few minutes. Now this particular supernova, supernova 1979C, was observed in April 1979 by an amateur astronomer named Gus Johnson, who's a school teacher from nearby Swanton, Maryland. He was observing the nearby galaxy M100, which is shown here, um, in the digital sky survey, and then again in the VLT. And now, as you see in x-rays, where a supernova 1979C is actually seen, he was observing it um, just because this is what he liked to do. And at the time, his was only the third discovery by direct detection of a supernova. 
So in x-rays, it's been observed with several observatories. First with Einstein X-ray Telescope in 1980, which actually didn't detect it, and then later on in 1995 with the ROSAT X-ray Telescope. Now, between observations with ROSAT and now, there have been several observations done with Chandra, XMM-Newton, and also SWIFT. And while it isn't unusual to observe X-rays coming from a young, evolving supernova, what is interesting is that the X-ray emission from this particular object has remained remarkably steady. In addition, while it's also been steady, it's also been extremely bright. And we interpret this high luminosity or high brightness as evidence for accretion of supernova material back onto the black hole. Now, when we speak of accretion, what we're talking about is material that's being fed back onto something. And in the case here, as it's accreted onto the black hole, it heats up to very high temperatures and becomes very bright in x-rays. In the case here, we can use the brightness um, of the accretion onto the black hole to find out that this a uh, black hole probably has a mass of around five times the mass of our sun. So the question becomes, why is it that we think that some of the X-ray emission that we're observing, or most of the X-ray emission that we're observing, is coming from accretion onto a black hole and not by other some physical mechanism? Well, as it turns out, there are actually several mechanisms for uh, X-ray emission from a supernova. One is that you have the blast wave just expanding out into the progenitor's wind. And in this case, the blast wave will heat the surrounding material to high temperatures. The problem with our, that interpretation that we found in this case is that as the blast wave expands, the X-ray emission should actually decrease with time because it's expanding, the blast wave is expanding into less and less material. If we had observed that the X-ray emission was fading, we might actually be comfortable with that interpretation, but as it is, we weren't. So another possibility is that when this star exploded, it formed what's called a magnetar. Now, a magnetar is just a special type of neutron star with an extremely high magnetic field. And the idea is that as this magnetar is formed, it loses some of its rotational power to the, uh, it loses some of its rotational energy and powers the light curve in x-rays. The problem here is that, once again, you know, the x-ray emission is actually going to be assumed to decrease with time. And we developed a model for what the magnetar emission should look like over time, and we found that we're about a factor of 10 times brighter than what the model predicts. So, excuse me. Now, while our observations are consistent with that of an accreting black hole, there's actually another intriguing possibility, and that is that we're looking at something called a pulsar wind nebula, such as the Crab Nebula in our own galaxy. In this case, instead of looking at something that's actually accreting material, we have a rapidly spinning neutron star that's sending out very high energy electrons and other particles out into the surrounding material. And in that case, we're actually looking at the emission from that star rather, we're actually looking from the wind rather than from the accretion. In any case, whether it's a pulsar wind nebula or a black hole, we're looking at one of these objects in its infancy and that in and of itself is exciting. So we have ideas as to how we can actually t test these various theories. And we have observations which are coming up in the near future. And if we find that this particular object is still as bright as it's been for the last uh, almost 20 years at this point in x-rays, um, when you account for the fact that it was only redetected in 1995, we plan on maybe getting a longer observation where we can actually look at a detailed spectrum of this object and test whether the x-ray emission is coming from some sort of central compact object or the blast wave, or possibly, um, or likely a uh, combination of both. So with that, I'd like to turn over um, the speaker to Avi. Thank you. So we are here to discuss a question that is often uh, asked in Hollywood. How do stars end their life? Except we're dealing with real stars. And when a star is uh, 10 times more massive than the sun, or even more than that, uh, the star, the core of the star, may collapse at the end of its life. Uh, once the nuclear fuel is consumed in, near the center of the star, um, the core collapses, loses pressure support, and collapses upon itself due to its own gravity. And it can end up in one of two ways. Either it makes a neutron star, which is the densest form of matter um, that we know about. It has the density similar to that of an atomic nucleus and a size comparable to that of a big city, or it ends up in a black hole, which is uh, an object to which you can get in, but can never get out of, uh, sort of the ultimate prison. 
And theorists, theoretical astrophysicists, were debating for many years about the um, boundary between a star that can make a black hole and a star that can end up as a neutron star. And the fate of the star depends on many factors. Most importantly, the mass of the stars. Um, it can also depend on whether the star has a companion, whether it rotates, and so forth. The progenitor of supernova 1979c uh, is estimated uh, to have been a star with 20 solar masses on the boundary uh, that theorists postulated for the transition between a neutron star and a black hole. And so it could very well have been the progenitor appropriate for making a black hole. Uh, this particular supernova belongs to a rare type of um, these explosive events um, that includes about 6% of all core collapse uh, supernova. These are called type 2 linear uh, supernova in which the uh, light curve peaks and then declines steadily by many orders of magnitude. In difference for the more typical uh, types of supernovae that reach a peak, decline a little bit, and then uh, remain steady for a long while. These are called type 2 plateau. Now, about 20% of all core collapse supernova are believed to end up as black holes. And it is believed that stars more massive than about 20 or 25 solar masses end their life that way. If our interpretation is correct, and indeed supernova 1979C ended up as a black hole, then of course it's the first time that we're seeing um, a black hole being born in a normal supernova. It has been conjectured for a while that black holes do form in explosive events that take place across the universe. These are called gamma ray bursts. In these events, uh, the core of the star may collapse to make a black hole and the black hole produces jets of matter moving at speed as a speed close to the speed of light. And those jets penetrate through the envelope of the star and eventually get out so that if an observer is lined up with the jet, it would see uh, a gamma ray flash. And we call these gamma ray bursts. We see such flashes roughly once a day coming uh, from uh, the edge of the universe. However, in this particular event, there is no evidence for a gamma ray burst. So it's the first time we see a black hole being born in a normal supernova. Now, um, the luminosity that we observe in X-rays is close to the limiting luminosity that a black hole can have. So if you feed a black hole uh, with a lot of mass, in this case, uh, the black hole may be fed um, by a disk of material surrounding it, um, either uh, as a result of material that was left behind from the supernova explosion or as a result of a binary star companion that donates mass uh, to this black hole. Uh, in that case, um, if the luminosity coming from the vicinity of the black hole exceeds a certain limit, the uh, force acting on the material outward would push the material and not allow it to accrete onto the black hole. And so there is this very natural characteristic luminosity that you would expect from a black hole that is fed well. And this is roughly the luminosity that we see for the typical black hole masses of five to 10 solar masses that one expects uh, from such events. Now, uh, it will take the black hole about 40 million years to double its mass. And so we cannot really trace uh, a change in the mass of the black hole during the course of the observations, the 31 years that we have observed this source. But the fact that the luminosity is steady is a clear indication uh, that we might be uh, seeing a black hole accreting at its limiting uh, accretion rate. And um, in particular, um, what we have are photos of this, uh, this source uh, during the first 30 years, during its infancy, uh, these photos are labeled by the age of the source, even though it took them a long time to reach us, uh, as we observe them today. If this is indeed a black hole, then there are uh, several important implications. Uh, first, uh, to the basic question of how uh, supernovae explode, uh, there are two possible energy sources for um, an explosion.